This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So hi, everyone. I'm Megan Garber. I'm a staff writer at The Atlantic covering technology. Um, really excited about this panel. I think it might be the only panel at this conference that involves props. Um, <laughs> so let's get to it. Um, to my left is Ian Shaquille. Ian is the uh, co-founder and CEO of Augmetics, which is a startup that does medical applications for, among other things, Google Glass, as you might have guessed. Uh, to his left is Todd Coleman, who's an associate professor at UCSD. He had a very long commute to get here. Um, and um, he has been doing work with uh, wireless uh, wearable technologies. Um, and to his left is Hallie Teco, who is the co-founder and CEO of Rock Health, which is an investment firm focused on digital health technologies. And to her left is Mick Ebling, who is the head of the awesomely named Not Impossible Foundation and also the inventor of the iWriter, um, which I think has the distinction of being the only device here that is currently in the permanent uh, collection at MoMA. So um, without further ado, let's get into it. Um, I will ask you guys just sort of to describe uh, what you're up to right now with your, your different devices, and then we'll go from there. So Ian, let's start with you. Well, my background's in medical devices, and I've always been passionate about uh, healthcare and augmented reality. Uh, late last summer, had the opportunity to try on Google Glass, and I literally had an epiphany moment. I dropped everything, and I founded the company Augmetics, along with my co-founder, who uh, dropped out of uh, medical school at the time. He was at Stanford. Uh, we systematically looked at just about every healthcare app opportunity you can think of for Google Glass, and we ended up focusing on this most pressing problem, the fact that doctors spend more than a quarter of their day on the computer, on the EHR, feeding the beast. I mean, this is the biggest pain point in their lives, every way you look at it, but it's terrible for patients. Doctors should be spending time with the patient in front of them, providing quality care, also seeing more patients per day. So we dog medics reclaim that time and rehumanize the interaction by providing services on Google Glass. Great, thank you. And Todd? Uh, yeah, so my background is uh, uh, up to my uh, PhD at uh, MIT <laughs> in electrical engineering. It was very much focused on analytics. And uh, my PhD advisor gave me some great advice before transitioning onto a faculty position. She strongly suggested that I do a postdoctoral study in something wildly different. And so I ended up doing a postdoctoral study in neuroscience. And so uh, as I took those two and integrated them together mm -hmm. in my faculty position at the University of Illinois, we were able to have a lot of fun and we built some brain computer interface applications where you could do wild things that involve neuroscience and engineering like flying an airplane over the remote control airplane over the cornfields of Illinois just with your brain. Uh, and that was done with a traditional EEG cap system, which, you know, somewhat like a shower cap and you have to apply uh, clunky gel. And so what I came to realize <laughs> is that, you know, we were able to be provocative and demonstrate these interesting use cases at the intersection of neuroscience and engineering. But in addition, there needs to be radical innovation at the level of how we acquire these signals. And so I established a, a partnership uh, collaboration with the material scientists at the University of Illinois, and we were able to develop, a, you know, I always had a vision of having some simple little device that I could just mount right onto my head, you know, easy to apply, and then I could record brainwave signals. And so after a long collaboration, we were able to establish a, a technology which we call a epidermal electronics. And so <laughs> these are very thin electronic circuitry that can bend with your skin, integrate naturally onto your skin, and can monitor a lot of uh, uh, information about your body, electrical rhythms of the brain, of the heart, et cetera. And so we have applications 
limitations in trying to realize my original goal uh, within a variety of contexts, uh, pregnancy monitoring, uh, uh, brain injury for newborn babies, as well as monitoring brain health during aging. <laughs> and if you guys can't see it uh, well from the audience, the device basically looks like a tiny little Band-Aid, basically, but it's gold. But gold. <laughs> um, OK, so let's stay on the theme of devices and go to Mick, and then we'll, we'll go to Hallie after Sure. Um, we have a for-profit company called Nano Possible Labs, and we are a crowdsourced device company. And it started through uh, this, which uh, I was joking with Stephen actually this morning about this, is that this was uh, absolutely an accident. Um, mm -hmm. This was a device that was created that allowed a paralyzed artist to draw again for the first time in eight years. He had Lou Gehrig's disease. And uh, we created it because he couldn't and he couldn't afford it, and uh, we felt that that was kind of a travesty, that someone's freedom of expression and freedom of creativity shouldn't be gauged by what the health insurance companies say or what someone's pocketbook says. So we took and collected a community of people who were passionate about, uh, this guy's a graffiti artist, so a community of, of hackers and, and makers, and uh, we flew them all out to our house, and my wife and I moved to the moved our kids into the kind of the back uh, garage, and they took over the front house. And all our friends thought we were crazy that we were giving our house to a bunch of hackers. And we uh, uh, two weeks later had created the iWriter, and uh, we created it for one person. That was just for temps, um, and that was it. And then we kind of woke up the next day, so to speak, a couple months later, and we had won <coughs> Time Magazine's or we honored Time Magazine's top 50 inventions and. Gizmodo, eight incredible health inventions to transform lives, and the permanent collection at the MoMA, and we were like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> this isn't, this isn't, we just tried to help tempt, and this is happening. So it really evoked for us this, this awareness of the fact that the crowd can give you the problem and also give you the solution. And everything we do is open source. So much like Chris talked about last night, um, we don't seek to hoard IP, we seek to provide solutions in the fulfillment of the solutions is kind of the main core of our business model. And then, of course, telling the story, which is my day job, or the company I've had for the last 12 years is a producer in Hollywood. So we told the story around Tempt, and that story, I think, was equally as powerful as the technology. The technology is a coat hanger and some duct tape and zip ties, but the story itself is what really motivated people to say, God, I can actually do this. And so what we're seeing now is people coming to our site and saying, hey, I have this problem, can someone help us? And I have this problem, can you create this? So we've got a whole series of different devices that we're in the works on right now. Um, Tempt, the guy we created for, had lost his ability to blink, and the blinking was the binary switch to engage and disengage the mouse. So essentially, he was unable to draw, then he was able to draw, and then the disease took it away again. So now we're creating a new device called the Brain Rider, which is, <laughs> you can kind of put the pieces together, where actually, instead of him blinking to engage and disengage, he's gonna think. And uh, I did a hardcore recruitment last night of Todd. And I think I'm gonna get Todd on the team as well. <laughs> no commitments yet, no commitments. Todd is fully committed, I have it on paper. <laughs> I, you didn't tell you, but I recorded the entire conversation last night. You guys should tweet that right now. Yes, exactly. Right. Right. Everybody tweet Todd committed to the brain writer right now. Uh, and we're doing things like a mouth mouse, we're doing things. Uh, we just came up with a, a laser cane, which is for a, a blind friend of ours, that allows him to kind of see things around the cane and kind of vibrates the cane when overhanging objects are close to him. So those are the types of things that we're creating. That's awesome. Thanks. And then Hallie. Yeah, I love these examples because they really show the cross-disciplinary benefits of taking uh, knowledge from different sectors and bringing them together and creating new solutions to old problems. And that was kind of the vision behind Rock Health. I was um, in grad school and I was working at Apple and I was covering the medical and healthcare segment for the App Store. So I was working with the developers that were submitting apps in the healthcare segment. Uh, and the woman sitting next to me covered the gaming segment mm -hmm. and she worked with better developers than I did. And I was really jealous because the best developers were building games and lifestyle apps that weren't really making a difference. And I thought that was, um, that was a shame that we <clears throat> needed our most talented developers, most talented designers to be working in healthcare. Frankly, we do. And so set off to create Rock Health um, with more of a tech background, and my co-founder, who's an MD, had more of the healthcare background, but we wanted to create um, a movement for entrepreneurs, really talented entrepreneurs like Ian, um, to get off the ground. And so we created um, a, a seed fund to invest in the most promising entrepreneurs 
um, including Augmetics, which we're really excited about. <laughs> we're based in San Francisco. We have 60 companies in our portfolio now. We're three years old, um, and our LPs include the Mayo Clinic and Kleiner Perkins. So we're working with really great industry partners um, and have just a really outstanding group of entrepreneurs thinking differently about how we can solve some of these problems. That's awesome. And I'd love to know, how do you actually think about just value um, when you're deciding what to invest in? You know, there's sort of the immediate side of things where, you know, more medical records and more data and all that kind of thing. And yeah. then there's the sort of more intangible, long-term um, ways of defining value. So how do you think about that? Yeah, so for us, it's really important um, because we are making investments, uh, but we also want to make a really big difference in healthcare mm -hmm. that all the companies have, a, you know, a scalable model and something that's sustainable. Um, and that's, that's kind of challenging in healthcare. Consumers only pay for 12% of the health care that we consume. Uh, we're not used to paying for things. We expect other people to pay for things. And so a lot of the, um, the movement towards consumerization is running up against the fact that consumers just don't want to pay. They're expecting their insurers to pay or their employers to pay. So um, you, know, you can think about the value that a consumer-facing um, app or you know product is is creating value immediately so maybe it's saving money immediately um, and I think augmetics is, is that case where you're saving money because a doctor um, is able to save time and mm -hmm. that's an immediate savings for the doctor and his practice um, or it can be kind of a realized value um, if, if you're claiming to prevent something you're not able to create and save money immediately, but you're saying we can prevent diabetes, you know, we're saving money in, in 10 years. And it might be a significant am amount of money, but if you're saying that the value will be created in the future, it's really hard to find someone to pay for that. Yeah, yeah. I guess uh, I, I could chime in and say on the notion of value from the researcher side, we try to be very careful as well because um, you know we were fortunate enough to get our hands on Google Glass as well. And with also this technology like the little patch, uh, sometimes people can get very excited about the, the coolness and the wowness factor, but they forget to uh, understand, okay, what's the value proposition here? How does this benefit people? So we uh, try to always do a sort of um, a gut check with ourselves to make sure that the projects that we're working on, there's a very clear black and white, you know, in the newborn brain injury case, you know, uh, the traditional technology is this big clunky device, you know, scrubbing the newborn baby's skin can lead to infection. Sometimes these babies can die from that while trying to monitor mm. brain injury. So if you can use a technology like this, you can facilitate not only the scrubbing of the skin and the baby being able to, to be monitored, but also facilitate things like a mom having skin to skin contact with the child. So a lot of the projects that we work on, we always make sure are very clear there's a black and white value proposition because not only is it important in the private sector, but we think also for research. That's awesome. Yeah. When scoping out high value applications for Google Glass specifically, I think there are two filters we should apply right now. The first one is whatever it is you're imagining, could it be easily done on a computer on wheels, a tablet, a smartphone, right. on telemedicine right. equipment? Right. You know, most of the time, your app idea can in fact be done pretty well on those alternatives, mm -hmm. and you should probably not pursue that right now. And the other, I think, filter we should apply to identify high value glass apps right now is, is your idea big? Is it a huge value proposition? There are a lot of sexy micro app ideas that are cool and doctors want and patients want, but frankly, uh, there's no installed base right now, so those need to come a little bit later. And that's how I think about, you know, prioritizing glass apps right now. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. And, and just to be clear, you're not just focused on glass, right? If, if glass does not become sort of the paradigmatic um, device, that's you're not true. about that? When I say glass, I mean it in the broadest sense. Okay. In, in fact, we are a, a hardware agnostic company. Our, our software and service runs just as easily on some of the glass competitors. For example, uh, the Vuzix M100, and there's many other uh, entrants coming into the space. It's a very competitive space. But that said, glass is the best at the moment. Yeah. I think yeah. on the point of value proposition, one of the things that we feel strongly about is not for us to determine what that value proposition is, mm -hmm. but to let the market sure. indicate that. Mm -hmm. And um, we, I was joking with someone that our R&D department is bigger than every medical company in the world combined because it's the world. Our medical department is the crowd. So mm -hmm. we can't say that the iWriter has a demand 
or that the brain writer has a demand, the demand comes to us and says, we need this, and can someone help us fulfill this need? And then we go out and create that. So one of the things that I'm really excited about is the fact that the market is coming to us. We're not having to go out into the market, which is great, because I don't think any of us in this room are smart enough to predict everything. Totally, yeah. Well, and, uh, so along those lines, um, you know, if we, it, it, I think what you're doing with crowdsourcing is so interesting, because or traditionally, that has not really been part of, of you know, medical development. You know, the doctors do things here, and you know, the developments over here. Um, can your idea scale, do you think? Do you think it can sort of reach a more sort of institutional level? Um, because I, I know in Silicon Valley especially, there's all this concern about sort of siloing, and you know, there's Silicon Valley here, and the rest of the world here, and how do you sort of reconcile the two? So I think so, because I think the way that it becomes more of a fulfillment, and our yeah. fulfillment can be diversified, it can be, um, but the, the thing that I love about it is if you look at like a classic clinical trial or clinical, um, or any kind of test bed to create any type of technology, you start, you start with conference calls, those conference calls get rescheduled because someone got sick, and then the conference room got moved, so we moved the next day, and then you have all these things going on. So you've got this long development cycle, and then you get to a trial, you get to some kind of a test bed, you figure out what's wrong with it, and then you go back to the beginning. Ours is like this. We have a really tight development cycle because yeah. This, this is version 1.0. This, is, this was obsolete six months later because people, there was a group in Korea that picked it up and developed it and made it better. So we don't even use this anymore. So this is, this is essentially kind of like the Apple, you know, yeah. uh, the, little, the little box. Yeah. And so that development cycle, I think, is what the value proposition is to our consumers, our people who need these things, is that we're going to be able to say, look, you can have it for free. Go for it. You know, if you want it. It's, here's the code, you can build it yourself. But you know, just quick show of hands, if you had someone in your family directly related to you who needed the iWriter right now, and I said, here's all the code. In fact, I even bought all the materials and put it in front of you and said, you could build one for yourself right now, or click buy it now, and it shows up on your doorstep three days later. How many people would, buy, how many people would click buy it now? I would too, and I've built a lot of these things. I got I got to go to soccer practice, you know. I, I got I got stuff in my life, so I think that that's kind of where the value proposition comes from. Okay. And how we scale is that there's going to always be that need, and then we can kind of put out into the community how that need gets fulfilled. Okay. Yeah. I mean, on, on that note, um, there's a huge trend now in crowdfunding for actual research. Mm -hmm. um, there's a company, Mycorrhiza, that's doing really well that I actually invested in, um, but they're they're taking kind of the the trial um, research phase of things. So it's not necessarily hardware, but for researchers that don't have the patience to sit through grant writing um, and really want to crowdsource some of the funding for that, which is a neat trend. Yeah. Okay, that's awesome. Um, and can we talk a little bit about people, like patient reaction um, sure. to Google Glass in particular that, that you guys have seen? Um, oh, one of the first questions I get is, will patients actually be okay with their doctors wearing Glass, especially patients outside of Silicon Valley, yeah. and so the, it, actually, you know, would would you guys want your doctors to be wearing glass? Just another poll, yeah, but not you. You guys know. Yeah. Seems like a generally oh, okay. positive okay. crowd, but we're not yeah. exactly representative. Exactly, right? yeah. Well, so, so I think we've gone a long way towards answering this question. We've run a study at three very different pilot sites where we've had uh, patients see their see doctors who are wearing glass. And 99% of the time, they were perfectly OK. And this is no accident. It's really because we've designed a patient education process. Um, when you go to, see, go to an Augmetics facility, you don't just walk into the room and see your doctor wearing glass. You're actually greeted at the front desk, told about Augmetics, why your doctor is wearing it, what's in it for you, how your data is being safeguarded. And then most importantly, you're, you're given the option. You can have your doctor take off glass at any time or have him disable the camera. So if you empower the patient, if you make the process transparent, you get really terrific results. And uh, we're very encouraged. Yeah, OK. Yeah, That's and I right. guess I could pick up on a, you know, a sort of dual aspect of that theme, which is that glass can not only <clears throat> you know, mm -hmm. help, help, let's say, the clinician monitor the patient better, but in some ways, it can allow us to understand how the doctor makes decisions. And so uh, we're fortunate enough to get our hands on glass. And we've got uh, some uh, undergraduate students that are doing a senior design project in bioengineering mm -hmm. using glass, working with a uh, movement disorder specialist who uh, deals with Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. And so um, you know, with Parkinson's disease, typically the clinician 
takes a look at someone as they, they do a, a variety of behaviors and they provide a score. And so there are ways that you could try to quantify the person's behavior using things like the Microsoft Connect or the new Leap Motion. And that gives you some aspect of, of you know, the, the kinematics of what someone is doing. Mm -hmm. But what's fascinating is when you watch these clinicians, uh, how they provide their score is not just a question of they're focusing on the analytics, but they're also taking a look at um, basically the facial expression. How difficult is it for this person to try to engage in this movement. So if we you know, dovetail off of the conversation last night about you know, big data and analytics, it's not, it might not be enough just to have a Microsoft Connect there, but in addition, we need to understand how the doctor is taking the kinematic information as well as the facial expressions into providing a subjective score so that in the future we could build computer mm. algorithms that in some sense mimic the doctor. Wow. So we could imagine that glass is allowing uh, us to also understand our doctors better. That's yeah. interesting. Well, and so that makes me think though of, of the sort of legal side of things, not in terms of the IP, but in terms of like malpractice suits and this kind of thing. Um, how do you guys see that, um, see these new forms of, of data and record keeping affecting that? Well, you know, c cameras and AV equipment are not new in the healthcare environment, they've been around for some time, and we adhere to the same privacy and security standards that you would that, that have been set, basically. Um, that said, I mean, I think that we're all figuring this out culturally, and what's psychologically okay with people. I think it's all about transparency and empowerment. Um, but that said, I mean, the time will come also when the patient's going to walk in with Google Glass or <laughs> setting down the iPhone and and, make, and recording the visit. And so it's a broader discussion. I think we're all going to get have to get used to these devices around and talking about them, whether or not we're going to have them on or off or to what degree. And I'm encouraged that it's a force for good in healthcare and in, in society in general. I thought the gentleman last night picked up on that pretty well. It's how the doctor has the conversation with you. Let's think through this together. Let's search on the internet together. Right. So mm -hmm. I think those things will figure themselves out with time. Yeah. <laughs> And one of the things I thought was so interesting about this panel, it's, you know, you guys all sort of in, in your ways talk about sort of using technology to rehumanize um, the doctor-patient relationship and, and sort of medicine in general. And I think, you know, on the surface, that might seem ironic, you know, that you're using Google Glass or you're using, you know, all these, um, you know, different devices and extensions of humans to be more human in some ways. But it actually, it does make a lot of sense. Well, well I think there's a, it's not enough just to necessarily have a smartphone or something like that. So. I mean, I surmise that the people at Google spend a lot of time trying to get to the aesthetics of this right. It's somewhat to the difference between, you know, Steve Jobs and the fact that he studied calligraphy <laughs> at Reed College that yep. went into the design of the iPhone versus control out all delete with Windows. <laughs> and so analogously... Uh, <laughs> they just <laughs> admitted that that was a huge mistake, I think. Right. <laughs> and so analogously, you know, when we were, you know, tinkering around with, you know, being able to fly airplanes over the cornfields of Illinois, that doesn't scale because you have to put this shower cap on your head. And so we were very <laughs> interested and partnering with people who we, you know that do know very different things than us that understand materials and the materials property of the body. So I think that in the future to really get you know sort of the, to blur the distinction between biology and computers, it's really going to involve people who have this understanding of a variety of different areas, including materials and biology. And only when we carefully wed those together will we will we realize these these solutions that you're imagining. Yeah, that's awesome. And what fields would, would you guys really like to, you know, be part of, of this work? You know, fields that aren't necessarily part of it right now. Um, you know, social sciences, um, things like that. Are there people who, who would be sort of valuable in this conversation who aren't currently in it? Design. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. I think the people who have a need, I mean, not to be incredibly general, <laughs> but... Be I incredibly think, general. Yeah. But it's like, <laughs> if there's a need and then there is a community that wants to rally behind that need to fulfill it, then it will be fulfilled. Right. And it becomes, I think our role is to be the loudspeaker and the bullhorn and the, the entity that popularizes and makes public what that need is mm -hmm. and then kind of unifies that community around that with the particular need the solution might be. But I think it's just listening to what's needed out there. Mm -hmm. um, I think w if we just listen for a second and they don't have, the, what comes to us, what came to us with this is not you know, my brother's a paralyzed artist, and I wish I had an ocular recognition device that used a Sony <laughs> PS3 camera to track his pupil as the binary switch to engage and disengage the mouse. He just said, I need my brother to draw again. Yeah. And we said, all right, we got to figure that out. So I think if we just listen to what those basic needs are and then put the people and the community behind around what that solution might be, I think you're going to see not just a solution, but the iterations of that mm -hmm. solution are going to be incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. The happy accidents from that solution are going to be incredibly powerful. That's 
That's awesome. Yeah, I could see something like the data mining that we were talking about last night, where you actually, you know, go into Twitter and you know figure out the sort of keywords that would indicate some kind of you know intention or desire on the part Absolutely. of the public and using that. Absolutely. And, if yeah. there's enough people that say the word you know, kind of big enough, our conversation, there's enough people that say the word toilets in a conversation, yeah. then we're gonna be like, wow, this is really a fundamental need. We need to start, really look at this. And right. how can we invoke in a dialogue around this particular need or it's paralysis or autism or what, whatever it is, but not actually those are, the, those are the symptoms of the diseases, but the actual need of, of what has to be created. Yeah. I think also the, I think the mindset, uh, generally speaking, is crucially important, both on behalf of in the private sector as well as in the, um, uh, in the sort of research uh, area, I mean, I think one of the things that makes uh, Silicon Valley one of the leaders at what they do because people come up with the most uh, passionate, crazy ideas that involve <laughs> different disciplines, and your your peers get excited and they want to support you, and it's uh, so you know, and it's very natural. And um, whereas in other you know, in, in other sectors, uh, people are much more confined to, oh, well, is that a medical device, or is this this, mm -hmm. or is it that, and sometimes that can stifle innovation. And similar things happen in uh, in the in the research. Uh, communities where, I mean, the stuff that we're talking about involves, you know, medicine and electrical engineering and materials and in a lot of situations, people don't know how to compartmentalize this. Well, mm. how will this person get promoted, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that, you know, it's just really important for the mindset to change for us to realize that, you know, the 1900s, you know, Jonas Salk, you know, he mm. figured out the polio vaccine and the physicists figured out the, you know, the transistor as well as the, uh, the atom bomb, which, you know, mm. greatly uh, moved us forward. But I think in this new century, it's going to be all about at the intersection of these disciplines, right? Yeah. And so I think people who really sort of uh, get into this mindset and are comfortable with us using multiple disciplines to solve problems and being honest with ourselves, the people who lead in that direction will, it'll be an exponential growth. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I would, I would just add to that, um, you know, within and the reason we work really closely with um, hospitals and doctors and nurses is that they're really good at identifying the issues and the problems and surfacing them. Um, but they don't necessarily have an understanding of the possibilities for mm -hmm. technology to solve those problems. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, technologists um, really can see what's next in technology, but are often, they have a solution looking for a problem. And it's just so important <laughs> that we're all sitting around the table um, and we're working on these ideas together. Okay, that's I agree great. with her wholeheartedly. Yeah. I mean, we were guilty of this. I mean, <laughs> some aspects of this we totally over-engineered, and when we talk to our MD friends, they're like, you're over-engineering that. Focus on this problem. If you can do this, and the nurses can do this easily, the rest of those details don't matter. So it's, yeah. I'm guilty but of it this, myself. At the same time, though, I'm, I'm on a review committee at UCSF in t for internal grants, and some of these ideas I see, they want to do, they, they think that a Twitter or like a virtual <laughs> reality thing is like the solution for everything. Right. And we're like, no, that's, that's like five years ago. <laughs> Right. Doctors are also <laughs> guilty of that. I think one of the things that's important too when you're finding those mm -hmm. solutions is um, putting a, a face on that, on mm -hmm. what that problem is. Mm -hmm. And that there's the, the humanity, I think, of so much of what we do is lost because you're like, the conversation, how does this scale? Or what's the mass market? Or how do we make this big? And I think when you make it about one person, mm -hmm. um, we have a kind of an internal mantra at our company, which is help one, help many, because mm -hmm. everybody in a community can relate to Jim or Jane or Mary mm -hmm. or Steve because we're just going to help that one person. But if we help that one person, then the natural ramifications of that are going to be to help many people. Mm -hmm. So I think that and when you're looking for what those solutions are for the, what the problem is to, to apply that solution to, making it so that there's actually a face associated with that makes mm -hmm. it so it's so much more relatable and so much more, I think, emotional. That's fantastic. Yeah, because you, you do tend to think of medicine as this sort of, you know, nebulous kind of thing when which actually is, it's so intimate. It's the most intimate Which is thing. pretty funny, which yeah. is what it's trying to do is make yeah. it actually a person talking to a person and trying exactly. to help them. Awesome. Well, thank you. I think on that note, we're going to have to wrap it up. But thank you all very much for being here.